Not sure what to do with it. Oh, this is not <laughs> Not sure what to do with it. My dad got me a job teaching science. I found this university rather difficult. In those days, they'd publish the exam results on the notice board. I'd start from the bottom and go up. Oh. <laughs> My dad convinced me that this was a good thing. If I found it difficult to understand, I understand why my students found it difficult too. My first job was in a rather difficult inner city school in Coventry. It was tough but rewarding. This is easy to say now, but sometimes the rewarding part was difficult to believe. I remember on one occasion, that's better, it's a light on now. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I remember on one occasion I, I, I was standing in the washroom, praying that someone would lock me in, just so I could miss my next class. <laughs> All classes were mixed ability. Some students went to Oxford University, others did not. <laughs> to cope with such a diverse group, all classes were student-centred. In other words, the teacher handed out assignments and the students got on with it. This isn't the way I was taught at school, so I had difficulty defining my role in the classroom. I get easily bored and would walk around trying to engage the kids in conversation. I found the best kids would ask lots of questions, leaving little time to help the ones that needed the extra, extra explanation. Gradually I moved to the front of the classroom and discovered I liked to perform in front of my captive audience. <laughs> After eight years I'd abandoned the worksheets in favour of me. <laughs> when I started performing I relied heavily on my notes, like now. Frequently referring to the text to remind myself how to derive equations and explain concepts. Constantly thinking about what to say next. Always just one step ahead of the students. I say always ahead. But that was before I got a job at Atlantic College. It's not that these students were cleverer, it's just they knew they were clever and wanted to prove to me that they were clever. <laughs> they also didn't have the same reserve as the average Brit. If I made an error on the board, a Brit might say, excuse me, I think you made a mistake. A Finnish student would say, wrong! <laughs> Yuka Karaninen was actually being polite. It was just a different sort of politeness. After 15 years of working with nurse, I got bored. So to make these more interesting, I threw them out. After a while, I found I no longer had to think what to say, so I was able to concentrate on what they were thinking. On silent day, we weren't allowed to talk, so I wrote questions on the board, waited for the students to answer, then wrote the wrong answer that they thought was the right answer on the board. They couldn't believe it. I'd become a mind reader. <laughs> Physics is about movement, apart from statics, which isn't. <laughs> Explaining movement using chalk on a board is quite challenging, so we use many tricks. The most common one is to draw the beginning and the end diagrams, or even the during, the beginning, during, and after diagram. We can, of course, show the real thing. Oops, sorry. <laughs> But it's all a bit quick and doesn't really do what, we, what we're trying to show. In my early years of teaching, I tried to use video clips, but often forgot to ask for the TV, and the videotape was never wound around to the correct place, so it never really happened. At Atlantic College, my classroom had its own audio-visual setup, but apart from watching the Tacoma Narrow Bridge collapse, I never used it. As physics teachers know that a lot of our students are not as interested in physics as we are. As a, re as a result, we, we become entertainers. I used to play on words, but word plays are lost when students don't know the meaning. So I tend to rely on visual humour, funny faces, <laughs> exaggerated gestures, <laughs> tripping up. There have, been, there have certainly been times when the laughter has outweighed the physics. I once set up an experiment to show that if I breathed in helium, I could shatter a glass with my voice. But it was just to make, to make the students laugh. As I hit the high note, I got out a hammer and smashed the glass. <laughs> I always thought it'd be great to be able to perform magic tricks. Class was bored, pull out a rabbit. Students sleeping, make the hair burst into flames. <laughs> I used to be frightened of computers, couldn't see the point of them. At, at university, the computer, a deck 10, filled a whole room. It was programmed by punching holes in little cards that were fed into a machine. Analyzing data with the computer took me longer than my calculator. I think most of the physics students would have failed the programming course if it hadn't been for a couple of particular bright ones who did all the programming for the rest of us. <laughs> Why learn programming when you can get someone else to do it for you? 
I first saw the magic potential of computers when I discovered the drag and drop friendliness of the Mac and the program called Interactive Physics. Basically, you draw stuff and it comes to life. The problem was in the 90s, the computers were so low that they came to very slow motion. I still thought it was worth, worth trying. It's got a huge computer screen, screen for my classroom. Problem was that to use an animation, I had to put down the chalk, boot up the computer, launch the program. Basically, I could never be bothered. What I wanted was a screen that was always ready. Advanced in technology led to the LCD screen. I read about an overhead projector that projected the computer image onto a screen. I got one. It was extremely expensive, very big, and useless. <laughs> technology was not ready yet. The smart board changed my life. Overnight, I was a wizard. Projectiles flew across the screen, fields interacted with particles and waves rippled across virtual ponds. The ability to visualise the invisible in animated 3D opened up new ways of explaining the unexplainable. Software developers followed tr the trend, the multicoloured algorithm replaced clunky interactive physics, and Jujuba gave us power to create the first principles. First, saw, first time I saw a tablet PC, tablet PC, I had an idea. Wouldn't it be neat if every time I wrote on my board, the students got a copy of what I was writing on their tablet and were able to annotate it with their own notes? I mentioned this to two smart st students, Thomas and Eunice, from Finland. <laughs> they wrote the code and we had a product, Snow Shoveler. It worked perfectly, but we couldn't get anyone to understand what it was doing. So we never, we never got produced commercially. Thomas also got me to blogging, web design and Facebook. Realising how easy it is to publish online, I decided to make the most of it. Students don't always appreciate the hours of going to write in tests and worksheets. But teachers do. So why not share them online? About 12, 12 years ago, I set up my first website for business teachers. It now has 700 subscribers. I was lord of the board and I loved it. <laughs> IB questions aren't very difficult. I would often pick one at random and solve it on the board as an example for my students. About two years ago, I started to struggle. Sometimes I get stuck on a simple step. It was when I was writing my second, second edition of my textbook, and I thought it was probably just tiredness. A year ago, I noticed my left hand was feeling strange. I couldn't use a fork properly. I went for a bunch of tests and found out that I got Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> you probably don't know what it is, so let me explain. I'm no biology expert, so I won't try to go into details, but it's to do with the brain. Basically, the brain, the brain starts producing dopamine, which is the chemical that's needed for the signal from your brain to reach your heart muscles. Without dopamine, a load of weird stuff happens. Let me show you. If I try to move my hand, this one won't work. I am trying. It doesn't look like that, but I am. If I hide this hand, I can make it do something. I've got lots of tricks like this. If I try to do that, I can't do it. I've got lots of party tricks, the things I can't do. <laughs> if I do something, if I try to pick something up, it works. But if I think about it, nothing happens. That's the reason I can still rock climb. Hanging on hold is okay. Putting my hand in my chalk bag is a problem. They say it's because I climb so often the movement is somehow programmed into my head. But I use a, a fork pretty often as well. That doesn't work. <laughs> it's not just my hand though. The brain is a whole lot more than moving my hands. Parkinson's suffers in some ways pretty much the same. Haviland sent out groups of Parkinson's patients and I can spot them a mile off. The head the hand, and the walk. My physio tells me to walk straight. I have exercised the walk with my head up in the air. <laughs> but it's so much more comfortable to walk like this. <laughs> the way it is treated is by placing dopamine with a chemical. I wear patches to release drugs a day. It's dopamine, not nicotine, by the way. <laughs> People sometimes say that it's okay to have Parkinson's because the, the drug controls the symptoms. But it's not really the case. It's like the brain's an expensive espresso machine that won't make coffee. So to fix it, you buy some first price instant. You get some sort of coffee, but the machine's not fixed. 
The drugs have some strange side effects too. One of the most worrying is impulsive shopping. <laughs> this doesn't worry me so much though. You can't buy anything if you can't get your wallet out of your pocket. <laughs> Parks is internally on the outside, the weirdness continues inside. Thought processes are fine, as is memory. Well. <laughs> when I try to explain the concept, there's something missing, and it just doesn't work. I can speak, I can think. If I put the two together, I have to stand, I can't do it. If I have to stand, think, talk, and write, it's even worse. Pretty bad for a teacher. Lord of the board, no more. The blank expression isn't too good either. Uh, can you help me with the problem, Chris? Yes. I'm becoming facially Finnish. <laughs> That's why I'm having to read this script. If I didn't have it, I'd be completely lost. Not that there's any beautiful concept here, but I just can't, can't put it together. People say I write like I speak. Well, actually, I write like I used to speak. Now I have to speak like I write. So what's to be done? Go back to the past, which now turns out to be the future. Leave the board and let the students do the work. Which coincidentally is just what happens to be the IB, what the IB is promoting through its approach to teach, teaching and learning. I said about making a series of web-based activities that guide students through this entire course. Integrating practical work with animations, theory and problem solving. Not so entertaining, but a good way to learn physics. If I wasn't able to make my own web pages, I'd be totally stuffed. Basically, I'd have to continue trying to teach from the front, gradually change from a pretty, changing from a pretty good teacher to a very bad one. It's not all good news, though. Is there any good news there? I still have to define my place in the classroom, and that's not something I can solve alone. I certainly miss clowning about at the board. How can I impart enthusiasm in my subject without being so enthusiastic? In the past, technology has enabled me to climb the top of the mountain. Now it's helped me crawl out of a hole. There is no cure for Parkinson's, things only get worse. What about the future? Well, I started work on a new project. I call it the virtual tutor. In fact, at the moment, it's the imaginary virtual tutor. I break the physics course down to the smallest components, then build a virtual web that connects the knowledge, skills, and concepts that guide students through the complex process of problem solving. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to place a physics teacher, just this one. Thank you.